Living green or sustainably is about more than saving on your electric bill and doing your part to protect natural resources. It is about a safer and healthier life for you and your family without sacrificing style, quality, or budget. This is a movement to provide all of us with clean air to breathe and water to drink, safe, healthy food to eat and places to live, and energy to run the places where we live, learn, play, and work. The Everyday Green Home Podcast helps you get the value of green for you, your family, and your community. Whether it's green homes, green living, or the people who make it happen, Join me, Marla Esser Close, to learn how green and sustainability practices and products work for you and our world. Your home is your refuge. It's the place where life happens. You know, the little stuff that happens every day, where you wake up and smell the coffee, where you read your kiddo a bedtime story, scratch your dog's tummy and all the other little actions that make our houses home. But our homes have a secret life. With all the complexity of our modern life, we unknowingly may be living in, building, or remodeling a home that is not in our best interest. It may be something big like old lead paint or mold, or new paint and cabinets that off-gas. Not good. But chances are it's the small stuff. The leaky toilet, the drafty window, or the products you use to clean and sanitize. Having a green or greener home does not have to be hard or require sacrifice. A green home is not all or nothing. It starts with making smart choices about products and materials as you live in, build, or remodel your home. Just making a different choice in an appliance or plumbing or lighting fixture or even paint can set you on the course to a home which works better for you and yours. With the help of my book, Living Green Effortlessly, Simple Choices for a Better Home, we will cover the basics of the systems and features of your home and how to make the best of them. Join me to get started on your better home. Well, hello, it's Marla, the Green Home Coach, back for another chapter in my book series, I got to tell you that this has been really cool for me to share this with you guys. And I wrote this book to be helpful for everybody and to share a lot of my experiences and help you not have to make the same mistakes that I was making and to be able to share from those experiences. So I hope that's happening for you. I would love your feedback. If you're listening to this on the podcast and in the podcast app, if you're listening to this in the Facebook group, there's space there to comment. But I really would like to know if you're finding something here that's something you can do, an action that you can take. So thank you for spending your time with me. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to help. So Living Green Effortlessly, Simple Choices to a Better Home, my book that I wrote for you because your home is your refuge. It's the place where life happens. You know, all the little stuff that happens every day. You wake up, you smell the coffee, you read the kiddos a bedtime story or scratch your dog's tummy. You know, all the other little actions that make our house home. But our homes have a secret life. And with all the complexities of our modern lives, we may not even know it. And some of those are big things and some of those are little things and a lot of times the little things, but a lot of times we unknowingly may be living in a home that's not in our best interest and may even be making us sick. So this book is helping you and me to go through that together. But today's chapter is really talking about some actions that we can take. And this is exactly why I wrote this book, to help you know about and change that small stuff. That's kind of why I I joke that maybe the title of my book really should have been Simple Choices to a Better Home and you just get to live green effortlessly. (laughs) Because the better home is really, really what it's all about. So at any rate, I get so excited. So today's chapter is what goes in your home, what to think about, what to look for, what to choose. This is chapter four, if you're following along in the book. So guess what? 
if you think about that title, what goes in your home, what to think about, what to look for, and what to choose, these are all actions that we get to take. So there is a lot of choice here. And a lot of these choices are inside our home in the more decorative elements, in the features that we choose and the fixtures. So we're going to talk about some of those in today's chapter. But I really wanted to start you off. I wanted to read you just the beginning of this chapter. We turn now to considering. So I really have the book. Anyway, we turn now to considering what the things in your house are made of such as wood, metal, glass, paint, varnish, and glue, and plastic. How on earth are you supposed to know which products are the best made, the most efficient, and the most earth-friendly? And now I add people-friendly, because it's people-friendly first, right? You can check online at various websites, especially of the nonprofits that set the standards on sustainable, eco-friendly products. And of course, you don't want to bring VOCs, that's volatile organic compounds, or toxins into your home if you don't have to. But if you don't know they're there, then you might bring them home by mistake. And this is what happens a whole, whole lot. We just don't know. I don't know how many of you remember when food labels first came out. I know I'm giving away my age. <laughs> At any rate... But, you know, before food labels came out, we didn't know what was in our food. We didn't know how much sugar there was or how much hydrogenated fat or how much good stuff, you know, how much grain or vegetables or whatever. And when we didn't know the calorie counts, we didn't really know much except for what we could research in books. And I don't think the internet was a big thing then. So if it existed at all. So anywho, food labels changed all of that. And now we have labels that can go on our stuff and our building materials and the goods that we buy, as well as our food. They're not quite as standardized yet as food labels are, but we're really making some good strides. And there's a lot of third-party certifications, independently tested and verified, that can go on those labels. And those, I call them green labels, those are a great shortcut to know that you're getting a product, a material, that has been tested and certified by somebody not related to the company. So that's a really good way. I call them the shortcuts. So just, you'll hear me talk about them throughout my work. And it's a big part of what I teach is how to use those green labels and use them to your advantage. So anywho, that applies for all of the things that we're choosing in our home, but especially in this chapter, because there's a lot of research that could go in otherwise. <laughs> and any time that we can take a shortcut is helpful. So where to start with what goes in our homes? Well, we're going to start with flooring. We, and I'm going to quote from the book, we walk, roll, crawl, lay, and play on the floor every day, typically without a thought or care about it until the time comes that you have the need to shop for it. There are hundreds, I'd say thousands, of choices. And like most things in life, they all have pros and cons. You just need to focus on what is going to work best for you based on your personal preference, performance, fashion, and lifestyle. You may also, and I highly recommend it, take into account manufacturing methods and carbon footprint, but sometimes those are harder to find out. So lots of flooring choices, lots of decisions, and many flooring choices weigh in on one or two, or maybe even three of the different ways of being friendlier for us in the earth, this place that we live. And you have to kind of balance those. Some may have recycled materials. Some may be low or no VOCs. Some may be super easy to maintain and last a super long time. It is all over the board. So there's definitely a path that you have to go through and kind of make decisions and order, kind of like a funnel to whittle it down. So let's just start with the types of flooring that there are, and that will get us started, okay? So first one, I think that has been around a while is wood. I know it's been around a while and it's, oh my gosh, think of hardwood flooring as furniture for your floor. It's got that classic look, it can be timeless be really easy to clean and maintain and lots of color choices. Now, hardwood also these days comes in, 
I mean, true hardwood that's wood all the way through, as well as engineered wood and wood veneer. Really what we're talking about here is hardwood flooring as furniture for your floor is true hardwood that's hardwood all the way through. So while these other options have a place, just know for what I'm talking about, we're really talking about true hardwood. But I also want you to think through when you're looking at choices to make, think of colors. <laughs> Um, dark colors show dirt a lot, and I can speak to this from first experience because we bought a home that was a spec home, so it had already been built, so we did not get to choose any of our interiors, and we have very, very dark wood floors, and they are a real challenge to keep clean, and we just have one pet, and it's still really, really hard, so we are sweeping, vacuuming, and dusting them pretty much every day. So we know that <laughs> should we upgrade the floors, we're going to go with lighter floors. So wood, that's a great choice with a lot of category choices, even within wood. But that's a good start. So next could be bamboo. And bamboo is kind of, I mean, think people think about it like a wood, but it's really a grass. And one of the reasons you hear bamboo and green, that's air quotes around it, folks, in the same sentence so much is that bamboo grows really fast. It can be harvested every seven years. So it's rapidly renewable resource, whereas trees aren't. You know, they take decades to grow big enough for us to harvest. So that has gotten a lot of excitement about bamboo because it's this highly renewable resource. But, and that's kind of in capital letters, takes a lot of resources to manufacture the bamboo grass into product. It also takes a lot to transport it because most bamboo grows in Asia, a lot of it specifically in China. And so we have all the transportation to get the bamboo products here. So just weigh the pros and cons when you are looking at bamboo as a choice for flooring in particular. Next is cork. And this is one I really want in my home. Oh my gosh. So cork is actually the bark of the cork tree. And again, it's a renewable and fairly rapidly renewable resource since we only harvest the bark, not the rest of the tree, that bark grows back. So they can harvest it every nine years. Cork has been an option for quite a long time. It is the softest of the hard surfaces and that's exactly why I want it because I have knee issues and the cushiness of cork is so comfortable for me to walk or to stand on. And it's very resilient. It's also a natural insect repellent and mold and mildew resistant. So a really good choice, even in kitchens. I thought this was a really cool fact as the reason that Dom Perignon started using cork as a bottle stopper way back in the 17th century was because it was insect repellent and mold and mildew resistant. So thank you to the champagne world, especially Dom Perignon, for uh, gracing us with cork. And the last choice we're going to talk about is stone and tile. And I really think stone's been around for millennia because it was in the ancient Roman buildings. And tile's been around for hundreds of years. So, so we have some really long-lasting flooring choices here. Um, stone and tile are great choices for asthma and allergy sufferers because they're really easy to keep clean and they don't hold dust and dirt. So that makes the air much cleaner as well as... You don't have to sweep it as much so you're not brushing it into the air. Now, anybody that's had stone or cold stone or cold, see it came right up. Anybody that's had stone or tile floors knows how cold they get in cold weather. Um, wonderful in the summer. There is nothing like going to a beachside place with cool tile on the floor and it feels so good and it stays nice and cool. But in the winter, oh my gosh, that's downright cold, cold, cold. So great time for area rugs. It's a great time to think about something like radiant heat even. So you, know, you got to trade off the durability and the ease of cleaning it with that temperature factor. So whatever your choices are, you can still look for green qualities in any of those. So we're back to that, you know, natural, is it low emitting toxins? And the other thing to think about is how closely is it manufactured? If you can find a local option for your flooring, that's even better. So take a look. Like when I lived in Missouri, we had a lot of Missouri hardwoods that we could get really, really easily. So that gave us some really great choices. Now, there is all kinds of other choices of stuff in your homes. 
And I mean, pretty much just look around and you're going to see the many, many choices, even the things without thinking of your furniture and your personal effects, just thinking of the things that are attached to your home. So many, many choices, what you're using for wall covering, what you're using for your counters and cabinets and all of this. And we talk about a lot of these in other chapters, so I'm not going to focus on them here, but let me leave this thought with you. There are many, many decisions to make when you're choosing materials, but if you can follow this same method or recipe through for how you choose, always starting with what is the most important to you, and then fitting that into your budget, and then figuring out what your choices are. So for instance, if a natural product is very important to you, you start with that, and then you look at the natural products that are available in your budget. And from there, you can then compare different options and what their pros and cons are. So for instance, if durability and low maintainability is next on your list, in your values list, then you would look within those floor choices for ones that were more durable and lower maintenance. So a lot of different things come into that choice process, that recipe, but if you know what your values are and what's important to you and in your home, and by the way, those can change different stages of our life, but if you know that going in, it gives you those parameters to make your decisions within. So a lot of times when you're working with a designer, only how things look may be coming into play. So if you are working with a designer, please be sure to let him or her know that these other considerations are very important to you. The importance of maybe it's low emitting or natural, or let them know that you have children or yourself with asthma and allergies and need to take those into consideration. Most designers are trained in how to incorporate these principles into their practice, but they may not do it automatically. So because style and how things look is such a big part of the design world, but so is creating healthy, wonderful spaces for us. So if they're not bringing it up, you bring it up because they will work with you. Most of them will. So I'd like to close out this chapter talking about a topic that (laughs) we talk about a lot. Um, So bear with me, please. But we're going to talk about what I call the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And actually also we did a podcast on the fourth R, which is a new R. Um, So I will put a link in the show notes and in the other notes to link you to that one because the fourth R is a new way to think. And uh, so I kind of leave you with that little teaser. But when we're thinking about the products that we bring into our house and the products that leave our house or the materials you know, thinking about that cycle is what reduce, reuse, recycle is all about. So our first goal is to extend the life of whatever it is as long as possible so that we are throwing less away. I'm going to come back to away. And that we're using less virgin material. It takes way more energy, time, money, effort to pull virgin material from wherever its origin is, and to turn it into products for us to use. So when we recycle something, well, number one, if we reuse it, we don't have to do anything else to it. We just put it into a new life. If we recycle it, we are changing the form of that material, but it is still using far less energy, water, time, et cetera, to make it into this reborn product. So it was a really great exercise that um, one of the education centers in St. Louis did for my kiddos grade school. This was ages ago, not that many ages ago, a while ago. And, but it was an exercise to show the students how much difference there was in the resources and energy required to recycle a plastic water bottle versus to make one new. And they, they did this by making a big circle. They put all of the students in this big circle and it was like 20 or 30 students. So she ran a string from student to student until all of the students in the circle were holding the string. And that was the process from the time you extracted the oil out of the ground, refined it, made it into plastic, shaped it into a bottle, transported the bottle, used the bottle, transported it back to someplace away with air quotes. And then she took one end 
of that string and walked about down the middle of the circle and handed it to that student. So now she'd basically cut the circle in half with her string. And she said, this is how much resource, energy, and effort it requires to use and to make a recycled bottle. And it basically halved it. And it was just a really moving way to illustrate the difference in resources and energy and time that it takes to use and make recycled products versus products from brand new virgin materials. So think about that. Next time you are looking for something to purchase, you want to look for something that is not only recyclable, which is what the three arrow symbol goes on, to say that it is a recyclable item. And that means that it can be recycled. And it usually is a number if it's plastic, which is a lot of what we recycle. If it's paper, it may just, or wood, it may just have the recycle symbol. So that says that it can be recycled. The other thing to think of, is it made of recycled product and content? And this is really, really important because buying products with recycled content helps to drive enough of us to recycle. And our recycling system's kind of wonky right now. And the pandemic certainly made it a little wonkier, I think. But you can make these choices so we can support the industry. Now, the best thing to do is just use less. But what we do need to use, we want to use as much made of recycled content as we can and recycle it. Because When we do not recycle it and we throw it away, you have to think of what away is. Away is a place. Away is a landfill. Away is a piece of land that could be used for something else. Away is a piece of land that may be next to a neighborhood and may smell. But we need a place to dispose of our products, materials, and other things that we don't want. So reducing the amount of material that goes into away is a way, (laughs) is a method for us to help keep those landfills from just getting completely out of control. So there's my little speech on that. The other thing that I have changed my mind on quite a bit in the last few years is toilet paper. So when people ask me the top three things I do and I recommend doing, one of them is toilet paper. Are you laughing at? (laughs) Okay. Toilet paper, why? Well, toilet paper, typical everyday toilet paper, is made from trees that are coming from forests that are, you know, big tree forests. I had assumed for years that they just use the bits and pieces of the trees to make toilet paper, you know, like kind of all the leftover bits, and that they'd use the big bits to make other stuff. And turns out that's not the case. The NRDC, Natural Resource Defense Council, published a white paper about toilet paper. And I will see if I can find it to link in the notes. But they showed all of the process of making toilet paper and what it was using. And it was using these forests. So here in the United States, we have not changed two bidets or cloths to clean up. (laughs) So we are in the meanwhile, flushing forests down the toilet to wipe our bumps. So two ways to change this. One, Well, there's more than two ways, but let's assume that you still want to use toilet paper. Okay, we'll start with that assumption because there are a lot of other non-toilet paper options. So assuming you still want to use toilet paper, you have two options if you want to get away from paper made from big trees. Um, One is use recycled toilet paper and it is made from recycled paper, not from recycled toilet paper. But this is one choice. The other is to use non-tree toilet paper, bamboo being the kind I see most frequently. I have heard rumors and once in a while we'll see something flash up online about toilet paper made from hemp, but I have not seen it out there near as much as bamboo. But there are tree-free options for toilet paper and I would encourage you to look into them. Um, Most of the ones I've seen and used are septic safe, um, they're comfortable and they work. So enough said right? (laughs) So recycling is about so much more than just bottles or cans or paper we can recycle. Our building materials, our clothes, our household items, and even if it's just reusing, taking items to the local charity to resell in the store and help support community initiatives. There's just so many ways out there for us to lengthen the time something is used 
And then when it's no longer able to be used to recycle it into another form. The other one I've been using a lot is what I call reloved furniture. So commonly referred to as secondhand furniture, but I have found a lot of the online marketplaces and I love it because I've been able to try all kinds of new furniture styles, sizes, et cetera. And I don't feel a huge, oh my gosh, I got to make this work feeling. I can try things out. And if they don't work out, I know I can sell them on the same site where I bought it or a neighbor or a garage sale and keep it in the cycle. Keep that furniture used. Since furniture is such a big item and an expensive item, this is a great way to lengthen the lifespan of that furniture, keep it out of our landfills and recycling facilities and share the love with reloved furniture. So at any rate, I hope I have given you some things to talk about. I would like to close out with a quote from my book It was actually by Pete Seeger, folk singer and social activist. But he says, and this is a quote, if it can't be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, refinished, resold, recycled, or composted, then it should be restricted, redesigned, or removed from production. Think about it and join me next time for chapter five, which is, you'd think I'd remember the name of my own chapter landscaping. Ooh, this is a fun one. So I will see you for the next chapter. In the meanwhile, I hope you find three things that you can do in your life to make your life a little better with just some simple choices. Have a great green day and see you next time. That wraps this episode of the Everyday Green Home Podcast. Get the show notes with all the resources mentioned in this episode, and be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Ready to get started? Get more information, how-tos, and resources in my private Facebook group, Love Your Everyday Green Home. See you there, and remember that living a little better and a little greener is easier than you think.